Thank you, guys. So before I get started, can I get a show of hands for everyone that has used Erlang before? OK, good. OK, that's nice. Don't worry, I won't be asking any questions, and I won't be convincing you to use Erlang. Um, but I will hopefully introduce you guys to some principles that might help with your Go development. So first of all, who am I? Um, my background is in database and distributed systems. Uh, I worked on a database, a NoSQL database engine called React that some of you may have heard of and used at some stage. It was written in Erlang and deployed in a lot of Fortune 500 companies, AT&T, Symantec, um, Bet365, Verizon, a bunch of places where the kind of availability requirements that they had were well suited to the kind of uh, Erlang runtime distribution model that that uh, you get with that kind of programming language. Uh, since then, I started a company called Heroic Labs. We build core infrastructure for the games industry. We actually build an open source game server called Nakama, and it is written in Golang. So first of all, I'll discuss some of the similarities and differences between the two languages, because they do actually share some common ground. And then you know, we'll learn a little bit about what you can do in Erlang and perhaps apply some of those uh, core capabilities to your Go code, and you know, finally, maybe we'll talk about what we could do in the future to make distributed Go programming uh, simple as an abstraction, but as powerful as what you see in Erlang. So similarities, they both have concurrent runtimes, lightweight concurrency, some people call it green threads. Uh, it is a scheduling model that maps a number of virtual processes on top of a set of physical cores. It means they're concurrent by design, but also you can achieve parallel programming. Uh, it's both got batteries included standard runtimes, uh, standard libraries. So if it's, Erlang's a lot older than, than Go, so you won't see some of the things like JSON support and stuff like that built in in the way you do in the, in the Go standard library, but they both tend to be batteries included. A lot of what you get out of the package uh, can help you build highly scalable systems. Where do they differ? So first of all, syntax. I, I, I tend to find it the least interesting part of programming language design, the differences between syntax. But it is unusual to look at Erlang because it's prologue inspired. It doesn't follow the history of kind of C programming languages from a syntax perspective. You can't get simple binary builds like you do with Go. You have to use a set of different build tools, and there are a bunch of competing ones out there. Uh, it deploys onto a virtual machine. Uh, so you have this abstraction where your code sits at runtime and you can hot reload it, which is one of the powerful capabilities of the runtime, but you don't get as close to bare metal as you would with Go. Uh, finally, it supports distributed communication. And this is, I think, the most interesting divergence between what you get out of the concurrent capabilities in Go and what you get it from the Erlang runtime that's built in. So. The Erlang runtime itself, it's an it's a open secret. Um, it was originally called OTP, the Open Telecoms Platform. It has nothing to do with telecommunications. Uh, it's everything about building uh, abstractions, similar to sort of the Gang of Four. If you're familiar with thing, things like singleton patterns, adapter, you see something similar. They call behaviors in Erlang, um, but they are designed to help you build uh, your systems and, sh and manage state communication uh, in a scalable way. And as a result of that, everything has to be done in Erlang through message passing. So let's dive into a little bit of a code example. Um, obviously, the top is a Go routine. Hopefully, you guys can see, see the code there. And below it is what it looks like to create an Erlang process. Um, ignoring the final line, which just does IO output, which is your equivalent to printing some output about that state, uh, what do you see as the main difference between these two pieces of code? Right. Ultimately, the big difference is that the built-in function spawn in Erlang gives you a PID, a process identifier. This is extremely useful, and this is the fundamental building block that everything in Erlang builds on top of. Um, if we print out what that PID looks like, you see this really unusual structure where it's actually three numeric values separated by dots. So what do these values actually mean, and why is this process identifier extremely valuable? Well, if we break down the process identifier, it gets kind of carved up into three pieces. Part A is what we call the node number, OK? And this is where the Erlang distributed runtime comes into play. Erlang knows that the process that has been spawned 
in that runtime actually exists on a specific node somewhere that is running, perhaps in the cloud as a collection of machines, but it knows which machine owns that process. The next part is a kind of an identifier used to actually do the lookup internally in the runtime to find the particular process itself. So you can think of this as a, as a map. It's an oversimplification, but it's a map sitting inside the runtime that is used to actually address the specific process. And then finally, a little bit of history that, you know, because Erlang has a, a, you know, been around more than 20 years, you used to have a situation where you wouldn't ha have enough memory, so you'd end up wrapping around the PID space eventually, and that's what that C uh, piece is for. Um, but these process identifiers mean that you can know, no matter what Erlang node you're running, how to find a process that might exist on another node. And we'll look at what that means. But before that, with Erlang processes, the best way to think about them is a combination of a channel, a Go channel, and a Go routine. They sort of live together as a single package, and that's what we call, in much of the literature, an actor. And the idea is that these actors, it can be many hundreds of thousands of them sitting inside the virtual machine, they live alone. They don't know anything about anybody else. To talk to them, you have to send messages. Um, and to send messages, you need to know a way to address them. And that's where the process identifier comes in and other ways that we can actually register to say, I want to make sure I can reach this particular process by a specific name. But let's look at sending messages. So again, imagining Erlang processes as a combination of Go channels and Go routines you spawn some kind of process, you get a process identifier, and then you send it a message. In this case, we're sending the number eight to that process, and we're just printing out what we receive. Okay? So that's the very basic building block of passing a message into the mailbox, which is that buffer, that private buffer, and having that uh, process itself read from that buffer and access that data. But now let's look at what it means when we're distributing it. So, what I'm doing here is, just for simplicity's sake, we're taking the Erlang shell, and we are creating two servers. Okay, they're running on the same machine, but we're giving them different node names. Now, ignore the cookie portion, that's just a way to make sure that those nodes are allowed to talk to each other, but what we're doing is setting up two Erlang machines at runtime on the same physical machine, but they're two different nodes. And in this output, what I'm doing is I'm printing out through the built-in function node to tell you, you know, server one is node one and server two is node two. And what I do on node one is I actually register the shell's built-in process, which we obtain the process identifier calling self. I take that and I register it to a name. Now in Erlang you have atoms, which are just symbols you can use to represent some piece of information. So I've created a name called hello world actor. And so I create that Hello World actor, and then on the second node, I actually send a message, and I say, I want to address the Hello World actor, and it has this particular node identifier, so this is the node name you need to reach it, and I want to send the message Hello World. So we then, on the other um, Erlang shell, we flush that information out, because this is sitting inside the shell itself, so we have to flush it to see the output, and we get the fact that the shell received the message, hello world. Now what, what's actually going on here is quite incredible. The Erlang runtime is worrying about gossip, heart beating, node discovery. It knows how to serialize information on the wire, and eventually knows how to address another process on a different machine and send it some kind of message. It's doing all of that for you, and it does that in two or three lines of code. How does it do all of this? So when you actually start an Erlang node, and you start it with distributed Erlang enabled, what happens is a separate C application runs called the Erlang port mapper daemon. Now, what I'm doing with the output here is I'm just showing you that if I were to start the port mapper daemon myself with the debug flag enabled, you can actually see two servers registering themselves with that little C application that enable each other to be aware of each other on the network. And then if I call names on the Erlang port mapper daemon, EPMD, I can see those two nodes running and I can actually see what ports they're running on. 
Now, how does this fit in to building bigger abstractions? So once you have the idea of a process identifier, which means that you can, across a cluster of Erlang machines that can already connect to each other and provide gossip and RPC and all of the building blocks you need to build distributed systems, how do I make sure that if one process I want to talk to is around, how do I keep it around? How do I know when it disappears? And how do I link processes together to keep their lifetimes together? In Erlang, we have two principles for this. We call it monitor and link. Um, in simple terms, monitor is unidirectional, link is bidirectional. Um, but what we can do here is give you an example of what that looks like. So in this case, I spawn a process. I'm going to simply have it hang around for 20 seconds using the built-in sleep function. And then I'm going to monitor that process. I'm going to kill it. So I'm going to send it a kill signal. And then I'm going to flush the information from the Erlang shell that is actually monitoring that process. And in the common output, what you see here is I actually see this information that I received telling me that this other process was shut down. Something killed this process. Obviously, in this example, we're the ones who tore it down. But the idea is I now have a way to be signaled when some other process running on any other machine in the cluster actually goes down. And the Erlang runtime will worry about telling me about that. I just have to monitor that process. Finally, link. So link is a little bit more complicated. This is a bidirectional link. So in this case, we create process one, we create process two, but inside process two, we link it. And in doing so, what we then do is we say, well, I want to know if this process is alive, so tell me if it's alive. And at that point in time, I get back information tell me that PID1 and PID2 are alive. I then call exit. I, call, I send the kill signal to process one. Then I check to see the processes that are alive, and you can see that both of them are gone. Because by linking the processes together, when one goes down, it will tear the other one down with it. OK? And these abstractions get very, very powerful and enable you to build very scalable distributed systems with very simple primitives. In fact, the entire capability of this system lives off the fact that we have a process identifier. And not only is that process identifier unique, it also is aware by design of what node the process is living on. So it means it's distributed by design. Now, what are supervisors? So once I have the ability to link processes and monitor them, we get this concept of supervisors or supervision trees. In Erlang, when you talk to any Erlang developer, you'll hear this mantra that gets spoken about in various meetups called let it crash. And the idea is, is that if I have the ability to monitor or link with processes, I can build a tree of processes that together make up my application. They make up my application at runtime, and I can let a supervision system built into the Erlang runtime be responsible for restarting things if things go bad. So instead of me worrying about catching every error that might occur, whether it's some kind of transient network blip or something like that, if some kind of problem occurs that I hadn't foreseen in my code, the supervisor would tear down those processes, build them back up with a restart strategy, depending on whatever restart strategy you like, and then you get back into a good state with your running application. And by dropping the existing state that might be held inside those processes, you can always ensure that the system goes back into a good working state. Um, and that's where the real key to Erlang comes from here, is that an Erlang application is not just a collection of processes. It's actually a tree of processes that know about how each other belongs in a restart strategy. So I can have processes that are running to do database communication. I can have processes that run to do SSL termination. I can have processes run that receive on a you know, TCP acceptor socket connections coming from a HTTP endpoint, right? But together, that tree means that if something goes wrong at the database layer, I can just let that information bubble up, tear down the processes that were dealing with that information, and they just get restarted at runtime by the supervision tree. So how would we make this work in Golang? And this is where things get a little bit tricky. Go actually doesn't expose the internal information that it maintains about Go routines uh, that are running inside the runtime. It also doesn't have a built-in mechanism to create this concept of node awareness. As a result of that, what we can do is we can build our own abstractions on top. Uh, luckily, because the, uh, I guess, the computational model for 
concurrency inside Go enables us to build this kind of actor model on top of what they call CSP style concurrency, so concurrent sequential processing. So it's actually, Go implements a much lower level base abstraction for concurrency that we then need to build on top of to achieve the same kind of actor model or supervision abstraction for processes that you get in Erlang. Um, now, the trick here is, do we want to do this? Now, I guess this is an open question to the Go community. Um, I've been writing Erlang for a long time. I've been writing Go for just under two years. I like Go a lot. I just miss a lot of the things that Erlang did for me, right? Talking on a network, and how can we achieve all of that distributed systems uh, capabilities for free? Um, can we build the right abstraction? And maybe it doesn't live as part of the standard library or as part of the built-in abstractions in, in, in the Go runtime. Maybe we build it as a bunch of libraries. Um, where could you learn more about Erlang? Perhaps it will help influence some of the Go code that you write and the way you think about channels and how they sit alongside Go routines. Um, those are some resources, Erlang and Anger and Learn You Some Erlang are actually by the same author. He's an awesome guy, works, Fred Herbert works for Heroku on a lot of their um, uh, routing layer with Erlang. Uh, and then obviously you can go to the main Erlang website. And what are interesting projects that people have built in Go to try and create these kind of abstractions? My favorite one at the moment is actually a pure supervised implementation in Go, this is the top link there. Um, there's also a way for you to peek at a Go Routines identifier, um, but if you go to that code, you get some real warnings about never doing that. Um, but a lot of interesting projects are going on at the moment to try and build these kind of distributed systems abstractions. The real challenge is that Go comes with this philosophy around simplicity. So how do we achieve the kind of distributed runtime that we want by default with the beautiful concurrency model that we have with Go and pair that in such a way that we still end up with simple abstractions. Um, that's my talk. Um, thanks for listening. Any questions? It's a good question. So uh, shall we have Go OTP? Well, somebody's already tried to do it. <laughs> Go Erlang, uh, you can implement a node that's a pure Go implementation, so it gets rid of all of the C runtime code. Um, it interfaces directly with the same wire protocol as Erlang, so it looks to Erlang like any other Erlang node. Uh, it's quite interesting. I don't know whether it wins, it buys you much, um, because at the end of the day, you're not interfacing with, with Erlang on the actor model in the same way. Uh, you're just sending messages to an Erlang node. Um, what do you think of Elixir? I like Elixir. Um, it's a nice syntax abstraction that uh, some developers may find more friendly than the prolog syntax you get with Erlang. Syntax never really bothered me, so Elixir's nice. If you prefer to write an Elixir, you, you know, get all the same benefits you get out of the Erlang runtime. Uh, what do you think about the combination of Kubernetes, gRPC, service discovery? Will it enable OTP-like behavior? So actually, a lot of these kind of capabilities what we use inside some of the Go code that we write. It's just a shame that there's so much you have to write. <laughs> there's so many pieces you have to put together. You've got to write protocol buffers to get your definitions for your gRPC. In, in Erlang, you fire up the RPC system, you send a, a message to a PID or a registered process, and you get a result. Um, so the abstractions are building up, they're just, I'd like, I'd like to open the question of whether we can do more here and whether it's worth doing more. Maybe it doesn't fit with the Go philosophy, um, but it'd be interesting to figure that out. And finally, what are your thoughts about Proto Actor instead of using Erlang? I actually haven't looked into that project very much. Um, superficially, I've peeked at it. it. It seemed to add a lot of complexity to me. Um, I would prefer to stick with gRPC probably, I think, um, and just build up my own abstraction at that point. But your mileage may vary. It depends on what you guys prefer. I think that's it, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> thank you. Uh,